As I think you know, I'm John Veneri, editor of Catholic Family News. I worked with Father Gruner closely for 21 years, and this is a tribute to him uh, this weekend. The talks will be combined with memories of him, talks about him, and also about the message that he promoted all his life, the Fatima message, and of course, within uh, as, as the larger backdrop of the Fatima message, the Catholic faith itself. Now, I think you know this quotation. Cardinal Pacelli, prior to becoming Pius XII, I don't have the exact year, but he was talking about the message of Fatima, and he said he was worried about the Virgin's warning at Fatima of the suicide of altering the faith. Okay, so there was a, a, a warning in Fatima about the damage that would be done to the faith. We know in 1984, Cardinal Ratzinger said that the third secret warns of dangers to the faith, to the life of the Christian, and therefore to the life of the world. So we're going to talk about young Nick Gruner, as a seminarian, uh, who encountered these dangers to the faith and the problems he had finding a decent seminary. The talk is kind of going to be in two parts. Uh, the first, we'll talk about uh, Nicholas Gruner and uh, the travails he had finding a decent seminary. And the second part is usually uh, at these Our Lady of Advocates, I give a catechism workshop, but we replace that with a question and answer with all the speakers. So I'm going to give part of, um, the second part's going to be kind of a catechetical part. We're going to talk about the proper use of the word faith and the proper use of the word church in order to ground us in the reality of the faith. So, on to Nick Gruner. He graduated McGill University in Montreal in 1964 at the age of 22. He graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce. He actually had a degree in business. Anyone who worked with him would realize that. And while he was at this university, he sensed an attraction to the priesthood. But during a retreat, uh, the retreat, he was given very good advice by a re the retreat master who said, finish your studies, secure your degree, and move on from there. And that's exactly what he did. He moved on so much, he moved right out of Canada. Because after university, he embarked on an extended, solitary trip throughout Europe. He started in England. His family had roots in England, and he also wanted to visit Aylesford, uh, where Our Lady of Mount Carmel had given to St. Simon Stock the... Um, the, uh, the brown scapular in 1215. And it was here that Nick Gruner was enrolled in the brown scapular, and he says, and he would say this to the end of his days, that he found that wearing the brown scapular made it easier for him to say the daily rosary. So he would go on to visit France, Lourdes, even Garabandal, and he ended up in Portugal, but he never made it to Fatima. I should tell you, he was hitchhiking. It was a little safer to do back then. He hitched hike all throughout Europe. So it was during this sojourn in Europe that a pilgrim handed him a little pamphlet on Fatima. It was printed in the United States, and it focused on the need for the consecration of Russia. If my requests are not granted, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, raising up wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. And it was during this trip to Europe that Nicholas Gruner became determined to answer the divine call and seek the priesthood. So, in this pursuit, 1966 finds him back in Montreal, where he completed a year of philosophy. He went from there on to the Grand Seminary in Montreal for his first year of studying theology. But while he was at the seminary, he noticed a kind of worldliness and a new spirit invading the campus. Now look at the years where we are, okay? 1966, 1967, the Vatican II revolution is escalating, and this was the time, a time between 1965 and 1972, where Sister Lucia of Fatima would warn of the diabolic disorientation of various members of the upper hierarchy. Uh, the radical Cardinal Sunins of Belgium had exclaimed with jubilance that Vatican II is the French Revolution of the Church. The progressivist Yves Congar 
celebrated Vatican II, saying that the church has had its October Revolution. And so we have had, and we still have, as a result of the council, the triumph, quote unquote, triumph of liberal Catholicism in the, within the church. Now I say triumph in quotes because evil can never triumph the church, but right as the moment we have the ascendancy of liberalism over the true teaching. And the enemy often sees this better than we do. Towards the end of the council, and immediately after, liberals and Freemasons were cackling their cockadoodle of triumph regarding Vatican II. The Freemason, Yves Marcedon, of the Scottish Rite, in his book, Ecumenism as Seen by a Traditional Freemason, he praised the ecumenism nurtured at Vatican II. And I'm quoting now, he said, quote, Catholics must not forget that all roads lead to God, and they will have to accept that this courageous idea of free thinking, which we can really call a revolution, pouring forth from our Masonic lodges, has spread magnificently over the dome of St. Peter's. Close quote. Marcel Prelot, senator of the Dobbs region of France, he goes much further in describing what took place. He says, now he's a liberal Catholic, he said, we had struggled for a century and a half to bring our opinions to prevail within the church and had not succeeded. They weren't succeeded by the they didn't succeed by the way because the solid popes at the time formally condemned their teaching. We had tried for a century and a half, had not succeeded to, to make our opinions prevail. Finally, he said, there came Vatican II and we triumphed. From then on, the propositions and principles of liberal Catholicism have been definitively and officially accepted by Holy Church. Close quote. So revolution, destabilization, and new doctrinal and moral trends that in the words of the pre-Vatican II Holy Office, trends that wander far from the Catholic teaching handed down through the ages, these trends were gaining currency in seminaries and in institutes of higher learning, more than gaining currency, they were becoming the prevailing trend. Now, Montreal was no different in this respect from anywhere else. And it was here that young Nicholas confronted a challenge to the faith. And we could say that this, this challenge that he got here was somewhere prophetic. There was a group of students at the seminary, supposedly studying for the priesthood, modernist leanings, and they were advancing the idea. What were they advancing? They were advancing the, 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 the notion that the Catholic, that Catholic divorce would someday be permitted in the church. There would be such a thing as Catholic divorce. Now, I gather that young Nick Gruner was every bit as stalwart as the Father Gruner that we came to know, and he stood up to this modern group. He said, no, this can't happen. So the group responded to Nick's objections with the claim that Cardinal Garon, the new Vatican prefect in charge, uh, in charge of Vatican seminaries, was on their side, which was probably true. We'll talk about Cardinal Garon in a minute. And young Nick responded, I don't care if 10 cardinals hold that position. It is still heresy. Divorce for Catholics can never be approved by the church. Could someone get me a glass of water, by the way? So, if you don't mind. Thank you. Brendan, you want to get it? Okay. Thank you, Brendan. Anyway, now I say this exchange is prophetic because what happens? At the very beginning of his studies for the priesthood, of his priestly life, you could say, he encounters this challenge regarding Catholic teaching on divorce and remarriage. What was going on at the very end of his life when he died April 29th, 2015? He was in between the two synods, and it was this, 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 this challenge to Catholic teaching regarding marriage that was ripping the church apart at that time as it is right now. So at the beginning, thank you, thank you, Brendan. At the beginning of his pursuit of the priesthood and at the end, he is confronting, I won't call it a controversy, it is a betrayal, a betrayal of the church's moral teaching on marriage. So back in 67, you had these modernist seminarians uh, undermining the faith. You had Nick Gruner uh, standing up and defending the faith. What happens to Nick Gruner? He's thrown out. The rector said, I don't agree with your position, and it would be best to seek your vocation elsewhere. Father Gruner's position, by the way, happened to be what the church taught for 2,000 years. 
So the crisis of faith in seminaries, as I think you know, flash flamed through the church as a direct result of Vatican II. I remember hearing a lecture around 1983 of an American priest. He had gone on to be ordained by Archbishop Lefebvre, but he talks about being at Catholic University in the United States in 1968, and he said every day there was just another battle. We were confronting priests of the church of what's happening now. We were confronting priests who were undermining doctrine, who were telling us that there is no real objective moral law. All morality depends on the situation. So a few of, he and a few others ended up um, leaving that, that seminary, and they ended up at Econ. So it was a challenging time to pursue the priesthood, and Nick was thrust into this maelstrom, this frothing maelstrom, of post-conciliar events. So he decides to return to Europe, and in 1968, he finds himself in San Giovanni Rotondo. Who can tell me who lives in San Giovanni Rotondo? Padre Pio, okay. He was there for the last six months of Padre Pio's life. I don't know that he ever spoke with Padre Pio. There is a picture of him receiving a blessing from Padre Pio, and I do believe he assisted at his masses. Um, and, and he was there, too, at the time of Father uh, Padre Pio's death. So. Less than a, a month later, Nicholas Gruner saw Fatima for the first time in his life. The date was October 13th, 1968. And though Father Gruner, yes, Father Gruner would return physically to Fatima many times, but mentally and spiritually we could say that Nicholas Gruner never left Fatima. It was always with him, always in the forefront of his thinking and his preoccupation. And he told me, he probably told other, a couple other people in this room the same thing. He told me more than once that when he was studying for the priesthood, as he was pursuing the priesthood, he said, I knew I would spend my priesthood promoting the devotion of, to the message of Fatima, which he did. So by October 1970, we find Nick Gruner in Rome in some sort of Mexican community where he would study his second year of theology. The problem arose, I was just talking with someone about this just before I stepped up, servile work on Sunday. Uh, there was uh, the superior father, Morellis, I think that was his name. He would instruct the novices to work in the orchard on Sunday. Now, young Nick knew that this did not jibe with the third commandment. Remember, keep holy the Sabbath, which not only means we go to mass, but also we, 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 we abstain from unnecessary servile work. So he said he wouldn't take part in this. And of course, surprise, surprise, at the end of the year in June, Father Morellis told him to try his vocation somewhere else, asked him to leave. So by now, the seminaries are in free fall. Doctrinal and moral teaching breaks down. You have seminarians writing their own liturgies. Wild, really wild. The spirit of revolution, freedom, discarding what modernists call small-minded rules, and the mocking of those who look for doctrinal security. This lust for change and innovation was ransacking seminaries and religious orders. Now, the diabolical disorientation of aggiornamento took hold, and problem was, of course, is that Paul VI's Vatican would not support the traditional superiors who were trying to restore order. The example we have is what happened with Archbishop Lefebvre. This is prior to 1970, prior to him forming the, him forming the Society of St. Pius X. Um, this was while he was superior general of the Holy Ghost Fathers. He was Superior General of the Holy Ghost Fathers, uh, probably the largest missionary order in the world. Uh, he was elected in 1962, and he was there to around 68. And as the aggiornamento began to gallop, he found he had less and less control over the internal workings and disciplines of his own order. So what does a Superior General do when he's confronted with a problem like this? He goes to Rome for help. Problem, he received no help from Rome, from the Vatican dicasteries. Here's what happens. October 4th, 1968, Archbishop Lefebvre met, <coughs> excuse me, Archbishop Lefebvre met with Bishop Antonio Mauro from the Vatican, for the Vatican Secretary of Congregation for Religious, the, the sacred, con sacred Congregation for Religious. Archbishop Lefebvre explained that his order was in full revolt that he had lost all control. He had lost, virtually lost his authority, even though his superior general. Okay, 
Listen to the answer. Listen to the answer he got. Monsignor Morrow, uh, you, you, you have to understand uh, the council, the council, you, you have to understand, he's stammering. And he says, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to give you some advice. And it's advice that I just gave to another superior general who came to me with the same problem. Go on, I said to him. Take a little trip to the United States. It'll do you good. And as for the chapter, and even for the congregation's present business, leave it to your assistants. Okay, now, that actually happened. So this inexcusable response told Archbishop Lefebvre there would be no help coming from the Congregation for Religious, no help coming from Paul VI's Vatican, and after one last attempt to correct his wayward order, he resigned in October 1968, and the Holy Ghost Fathers became even more chaotic. Uh, this is an example of how the great orders fell. A Catholic writer, Edwin Faust, he experienced the same, a, a similar thing. Not that he was part of a religious order, but he was um, in the Philadelphia High School in the end of the 60s, and they were trained by Nor the Norbertine Order. And he noticed that 67, 68, at the time his last few years in high school, the young, hip religious kind of took over. They were sneering at the old certitudes. They were sauntering in the mass with a, with a guitar strapped on, singing pathetic, effeminate songs. And the older... The older Norbertines, just, they were almost fearful. They just stepped back and let it happen. Perhaps they knew, too, they would not get any support. So, as I said, as you see, young Nick Gruner is having a hard time finding a seminary that's faithful to the Catholic doctrine, discipline, and moral of all time, but he's about to find something that might have some promise. Through someone he met at the Mexican community, he ended up collaborating with a handful of other seminarians who were in the same boat. The main associates he mentions are Ron Tangen, am I pronouncing that right, Carly? Tangen. Tangen and Les Stelter. You probably know these men. And they became involved in Italy with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Now, I won't go into detail because there is a lot of detail, <laughs> but they ended up forming a seminary at San Vitorino with the help of Brother Gino who was an oblate of Virgin Mary. So, of course, there were a, young, a number of young men who were seeking such a foundation. Word begins to spread that a seminary faithful to what the church always taught and that has kind of stepped out of the way of the maelstrom of <coughs> the, <coughs> the, <coughs> the Castilio Aggiornamento was being established. So that by 1970, Brand new foundation had 50 seminarians. So what was Nick Gruner's task in all this? Well, he was, he was one of the founders. He was always a leader. He was always a leader. There's stories of him even in high school. He was always a leader. And Father Kramer, too, talks about that the way, during all this time, the way he encouraged them, and he was always a leader. So his task was to find professors to teach at the seminary who were both competent and traditional. Three of whom he found were Father DeVos, Father Van Stiekest, I hope I'm saying that name right, and a brilliant Jesuit named Father Emmett Buckley. Now, <clears throat> this has special significance for me personally because I knew Father Buckley. I became acquainted with Father Buckley around 1988. He visited a place where I was uh, living at the time he gave me a crash course in Thomistic epistemology, which literally changed my life. It was he who introduced me to Thomistic philosophy. He was a master of precision of language. He was a master at making clear distinctions. He was remarkably well-trained in theology and philosophy, the true Roman school, and he was a first-class teacher. Uh, I had actually, I had actually met, um, I had actually met Father Buckley before, prior to my meeting of Father Gruner. I knew who Father Gruner was, but I met Father Buckley in 1988, and I would go on to meet Father Gruner in 1990. And we're going to talk about Father Buckley a little more when we get to the section on the meaning of the word faith. But again, master of precision of language, he knew his theology. 
I'll tell you a little story that, that uh, just shows a piece of this. Um, I, um, around 1986, 87, 88, there was a book circulating, and it was the revelations, supposed revelations of our Lord to a priest. And uh, it looked pretty good, actually. It was very traditional. And I gave it to Father Buckley. I said, this looks pretty good to me. What do you think? So he went away. He read it. The next day he said to me, this is, this, I, this is not true. This is not for real. And I said, why not? And he said, because in these alleged allocutions, our Lord refers to the Blessed Sacrament as a miracle. The Blessed Sacrament is not a miracle. It is a mystery. A miracle is something perceptible to the senses. Christ walking on water, um, raising Lazarus from the dead, or more modern times, the story of Pierre de Ruder, who had lost, due to an accident, lost this much of his bone in his leg. He went to Lourdes. When he went to the, when he went to the little uh, medical center in Lourdes, the bone had grown back. Okay, one of the most remarkable miracles of Lourdes. It's perceptible to the senses. Eucharist is a mystery. It is something that we, re that we accept based on the word of Christ, and it is, be uh, it is not unreasonable, but it's above our reason. So this is the type of, uh, this is the type of fun you would have with Father Buckley. So anyway, um, and it was, this was kind of, too, uh, a unique bond I had with Father Gruner because, in a certain sense, we had the same professor. Now, he had him in a more formal setting, but I had, he kind of took me under his wing, Father Buckley did, and I had some, a series of uh, private uh, uh, courses with him. And it was funny because every now and then we would be, Father Gruner and I would be discussing some theological point, and I would say something, and Father Gruner would say, uh, uh, th th that's your Father Buckley training showing. So, uh, in any event, this was the caliber of professor at this new seminary. I remember, too, Father Buckley talking about this. Say he was, by the time I met Father Buckley, he was kind of old, he was kind of crotchety. You know, you know, I, I was working with Nick Gruner in Italy uh, with this, this seminary reform, and of course uh, they torpedoed the whole thing. You know, it was torpedoed, we're going to see. And it was torpedoed by the agents of aggiornamento inside of Paul VI's Vatican, but we'll get to that. So anyway, here we are in 1972, and even here, Nick Gruner was involved with publishing. He and Ron Tangen and another seminarian drew up a pamphlet about the new seminary. Ron Tangen says in this, this pamphlet, he said, I am writing before the Blessed Sacrament exposed. And he went on to describe his experience about looking for a seminary for four years, looking, searching for four years. And he said all of them were bad and how his dream was fulfilled by going to San Vitorino. So over the next few months, that little pamphlet ended up being published in 11 small journals. I'm wondering if someone like Hamish Frazier would have picked it up. The brochure explained that the seminary was based on the rule of Venerable Father Lantari. Now, Father Lantari was the founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. He lived from 1759 to 1830 during that cataclysmic time of the French Revolution and the aftermath of the Revolution. And I'm quoting Father Gruner now. He said, one of the purposes of Father Lantari's congregation was to fight current errors. Alas, the modern oblate's attitude was, we don't fight current errors anymore. We're now in the age of dialogue, all right? And Father Lantari spoke of, this is important, he spoke of St. Thomas Aquinas as the first choice as teacher of dogmatic theology and of St. Alphonse Liguori <laughs> as the first choice as a teacher of moral theology. Of course, these are two doctors of the church, and St. Alphonse Liguori is the um, patron saint of moral theologians. So, in any event, the brochure, in this brochure, this young seminary promised a rich life of prayer to those interested in the priesthood. And I can tell you, to a young man, this is very attractive. Okay. They promise 15 decades of the rosary every day, one hour before the Blessed Sacrament, Mass and Communion, and a spiritual apostolate after the order. In other words, they're not going to be involved with, um, you know, uh, helping the poor and that type of thing. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but their apostolate would be primarily spiritual, administering the sacrament, preaching the gospel, saving souls, 
all through the pamphlet said the formation of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Alphonse Liguori. And Father Gruner said that that brochure struck a nerve. They received hundreds of letters. So what does this tell us? This tells us that at a time when the seminaries were falling apart, there was no shortage of vocations in the early 70s. There was a shortage, however, of genuine Catholic seminaries. At this time, too, the North American, I think it was the North American College in, in, in Rome, one of those, they were thinking about closing down because they had so few vocations. But unfortunately, this would put the seminary in the crosshairs of the post-conciliar Vatican, and the main agent of destruction was someone we've mentioned all, all met already, Cardinal Garon, who was at the time prefect of the Vatican Congregation of Education. A traditional order, you have to see, posed was regarded as a threat to the new springtime of the post-conciliar orientation. This, by the way, was the crux of Archbishop Lefebvre's difficulties with the Vatican in the 1970s. He just remained faithful to what he was always taught. He did not adopt the ecumenical conciliar orientation, and that's what, that's what got him in trouble, but that's another story. Uh, so anyway, Cardinal Garone had been on the side of the progressivist prelates at Vatican II. He had sided with uh, these, um, these uh, uh, progressives such as Cardinal Leonard, Cardinal Fringe, Cardinal Doppner, Cardinal Alfrink. And Professor Romano Amerio tells us, the author of that magnificent book, uh, E Oto Unum, uh, he demonstrates that Cardinal Garon had adopted a modernist line of thinking. Uh, you can look that up if you want, pages 371 to 373 of E Oto Unum. So here's where the breakdown started to happen. Because the seminary at Vitorino was a new establishment, it was not able to grant degrees to students. So what Father Buckley and Nick Gruner and Fontana, what the others, that what they wanted to do is they wanted to work with the Angelicum in Rome, that they would do their studies at San Vitorino, but receive their degree through the Angelicum, which is also called, of course, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas. Very prestigious, but now, like everywhere else, it's starting to become infected with the new orientation. And at the time, Father Gruner said, there were, there were still good professors, but there were also modernist ones, so you had to be careful. So anyway, that's what the new seminary is asking. We do our studies at San Vitorino, and then by means of exams or whatever, I don't know quite how it's going to work out, they would obtain their theological degrees from the Angelicum. This proposal was put to a vote of the Senate at the Angelicum, and it was given the okay. Okay, we're at 1972 at this point. But clearly this set off shock waves inside Paul the, uh, the Paul VI's Vatican, and a few days later, the Senate had to have an emergency meeting, a closed-door meeting, where the Dean of Philosophy told the Senate that Cardinal Garone had personally intervened, and he was against this proposal of Vitorino students receiving degrees through the Angelicum. So they had, to, so they had then to these students, Father Gruner and the others, had to attend the Angelicum, and they had to, of course, navigate through the good professors and the bad ones. So here's what they did. Here's what, this is what the first solution they came up with. They would study their theology at the Angelicum, but they still studied their philosophy at Vitorino under these good professors such as Father Buckley. But as you can guess, this did not last. Father Gruner, I'm quoting him now, it was reliably reported that Cardinal Garone at a meeting in the Vatican became angry early uh, in the early fall of 1970 that there were 50 seminaries at Vitorino School and all things that they were trying to do. It's interesting too, uh, he says that the superior of um, uh, the superior of, of the Oblates, he was liberal but he was happy to have he was happy to have some growth where nobody else did but anyway the, they're growing and Cardo Garone is going after this. <coughs> Father Gruner said, word came, to, <coughs> excuse me, word came to him that Garone pounded the table with his fist, saying, that place must be closed. At first, the young seminarians could hardly believe this report, but in time it was proven to be true. So the Vatican sent an investigative team to look into what's going on at this new foundation. He said there was nothing to investigate. We weren't doing anything wrong. We were doing what the church had always taught throughout the centuries. 
But this was merely window dressing of what they intended to do next. And what Garon and his uh, cohorts intended to do next was to close the school completely. And that's what happened. So by 1973, their internal school was closed. Father Buckley was removed. All the seminarians had to go to Anglican, go, go to Anglican, <laughs> go to the Angelicum to navigate the good and bad professors. And here's the type of thing that would go on. We're now in September 1973, and Father Gruner was still a novice. He was still in the novitiate of the Oblates of Virgin Mary. And the superior general of the Oblates had just come back from a theological lecture in Rome where the professor had denied that Jesus rose physically from the dead. Maybe Walter Casper was the teacher, you know, the great theologian. Right? So anyway, so the superior general said that he agreed with this professor and this, this, this crazy idea. And he said this to Nick and to all the fathers and the novices. And Nick Gruner said, that is heresy. The superior general repeated it again. And Nick once again said, that is heresy. The superior general repeated it a third time, and at that point, Father Gruner just walked away. He says, this, this is not a child's game. But within a few months of that encounter, Nick Gruner was asked to leave the Oblates. He would later say, when I said, this is heresy, they got rid of me because the reasoning they give, they always turn you into the villain. They basically say, well, since you have no confidence in your superiors, it's not reasonable that you stay with us. So, Vittorino is now shut down, and Nick ends up at the Angelicum. He received a bachelor degree in sacred theology, licentiate degree in sacred theology from the Angelicum, and he pursued his li um, licentiate thesis, and the theme of his thesis was Mary's motherhood of men in the supernatural order of sanctifying grace. So around this time, Nick was casting around for a religious order, perhaps to join, and he was advised by a spiritual director whom he called a gifted and holy man, Father Gabriel. Father Gabriel said, get ordained first, and then look to join a religious order. Get ordained first. So that's what he had did. He followed that advice, and on August 22nd, 1976, the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Father Nicol Nicholas Gruner was ordained to the priesthood. He would become associated, but he did not join other religious houses, such as that of uh, Father Stephen Minnelli, who I believe was at his, um, who attended his ordination. But he would, he would never join a religious order. He's now a priest. He's traveling. He's seeking a bishop to incardinate him. So in August of 1977, acquaintances from Ottawa asked him to help rescue a Fatima apostolate centered in that city. Uh, known as, uh, and, and this is what is known as National Pilgrim Virgin. The name of Father Gruner's Canadian apostolate still holds to this day. And in June 1978, Bishop Pascal Venezia, the Bishop of Avellina, who ordained Father Gruner, he officially granted Father Gruner written permission to live and to work outside the Diocese of, Avalu of Avellino. This was the formal beginning of Father Gruner's full-time commitment to the Apostolate of Our Lady of Fatima. And so if you look at the archives of the Fatima Crusader, the publication started by Father Gruner, you will see the very first issue, the Fatima Crusader, issue number one, is dated summer 1978, just months after he received the permission from the Bishop of Amelino to conduct his work outside the diocese. He began to tour Canada with this statue, the National Purge of Astrid, the same statue we see here. We are all beneficiaries of his work, and we are here continuing the work that he started. Now, I want to move on to what I said would be the catechetical section, because um, it ties in uh, with Father Buckley. Father Buckley, Father Gruner, and precision of language. It springs from a conversation that I had with Father Buckley. Father Buckley would often complain about the misuse Catholics, 
Catholics uh, misuse, not all Catholics, but many Catholics, their misuse of the word faith. And you even see it today in, in, in publications, you know. Um, there are people of different faiths, they say. Or Cardinal Dolan has great appeal to people of different faiths. Now, this is actually a misuse of the term because for the Catholic, the word faith in this context, now I'm talking about in this context, the word faith has a very definite meaning. How does the catechism define faith? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Very good. Very good, yes. Faith is the adherence of our intellect to a truth revealed by God on the authority of God revealing. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Faith is the adherence of our intellect to a truth revealed by God on the authority of God revealing. Our Lord reveals certain truth to us. And we know that our Lord is knowledgeable and truthful. Okay? Our Lord, he is knowledge, he is truth. He has revealed certain truth to us, such as uh, the mystery of the Trinity, such as whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, such as he who believes and is baptized will be saved, he who does not believe will be condemned. Okay? These are truths revealed to us by God, and we assent to this truth. We accept these truths on the authority of God revealing. So this means that the, the truths of the faith are not simply piles of pious belief that make us feel good, or we're not just responding to a sentimental attachment to otherworldly ideas that, 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 that make me feel spiritual. No, the truths of the faith are a form of knowledge, objective truth that we either accept or reject, we either live up to or we fail to live up to. And Father Buckley insisted, and he was right, that many Catholics over, have come to be sentimental Catholics. Their adherence to Catholicism is more a movement of sentiment or my father was Catholic and his, his father was Catholic and my great-great-grandfather was Catholic. It's more of a, it, sometimes it's more than that, but basically it's not really rooted in faith. It's more on sentiment. And they don't have knowledge of the faith as certain knowledge. It gave an example. This actually happened. This is a true story. During the time of the Second Vatican Council, he was with the Jesuit province on the West Coast. I think he was, it was, uh, I think it was the Spokane area. During the time of Vatican II, I'm not sure exactly what year, the council was still going on, and the bishop comes back from Vatican II. And he gives a, he, 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 he wants all the priests to come so he can tell the priests in the diocese and the religious, you know, the Jesuits and everything, what's going on. And he said to them, he said, oh, he says, you know, when we bishops, we got to Vatican II, we were just a disorganized bunch. We didn't know why we were there, what we were doing. But if you could only see the Holy Ghost pulling us together and making us one unit. I think it was more the, well, anyway. Um, and then he said, and fathers, I have an announcement to make regarding something I learned in Rome while I was there for the council. There is no such thing as original sin. The bishop of the diocese coming back from Vatican II, especially the inner workings and the people, and the, that's what he came back with. And he was jubilant about it. Now, here's the point that Father Buckley made. Was this bishop not taught original sin about original sin? Yes, he was. Did he teach it himself? Yes, he did. But he never understood it as an objective truth revealed by God that is immutable and that can, <laughs> and that can never be changed or second-guessed. He only, he only had a sentimental attachment to the doctrine of original sin. And so, when he was presented with an alternative sentimental approach, he accepted it. He said, this poor bishop never knew it. He never understood what was faith and the act of faith. And this is why so many Catholics had their understanding of the faith damaged after the council. Theirs was more of a sentimental attachment to Catholicism rather than recognizing the faith as an objective, immutable truth given by our Lord himself. Interesting, too, Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton, who I'm going to be quoting in a few minutes, he was at Vatican II as a paritas, 
And, he's, and one of the things that horrified him there, he says, the speeches of the bishops at the council, and including the American bishops, it was all drenched in sentiment. Okay, so faith is the adherence of the intellect to a truth revealed by God on the authority of God revealing. The Catholic never uses the term people of different faiths, even though you'll see it in Catholic journals. Father Buckley never misused the term this way, and you can listen to all, what, 30 years of Father Gruner's lectures. You'll never hear him speaking this way. So, you also notice, too, this is a, the, thrusting the importance of precision of language, which is, which is crucial in order to maintain our faith. And you will also notice that modernists and liberals thrive on ambiguity and equivocal language. As one astute churchman said, liberals and progressives like to live in a climate of ambiguity. <coughs> so, and this is the last point I'm going to make. The other term I want to talk about is the word church, okay? Now, this is one of the most, another one of the most misused uh, terms amongst religious people, especially amongst Catholics, with the advent of ecumenism. We hear people talk about a Protestant church, a Methodist church, a Baptist church. This is actually a misuse of the term because, as we're going to see from Monsignor Fenton, the word church actually has one meaning. It is the kingdom of God on earth the chosen people of God, the people of the divine covenant, the one social unit outside of which there is no salvation. Now, I'll explain this, but I have to set the stage a little bit first. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, during the reign of Pius XII, <coughs> especially at the end of his reign, there were a number of insightful theologians writing in the American Ecclesiastical Review who seemed to foresee the present ecumenical confusion. Now, many, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. The present ecumenical movement actually founded, was actually started as a movement amongst Protestant, Protestant missionaries around uh, 1909, 1910. And it was kind of a movement of unity and uh, so that they would get together and not really be across purposes with one another. And this movement of unity started to grow. And in 1919, these Protestants asked Benedict the Sixth, Benedict the Fifteenth, Pope at the time, we would, would you like, to, we would like the Catholic Church to be involved with this. Come and get involved with our movement of unity. And Benedict politely refu he politely refused. He said, "Yes, of course, it is my earnest hope for one fold and one shepherd. But as for the Catholic Church." We already have unity. We, are, we already are one. We can't give the appearance of looking for something that we already have. It's kind of like, imagine um, a, group of, a group of people, you hear that all the time too, we're, and you hear modern churchmen talk like this. We're on a search for unity. I see it in Vatican documents now. Search for unity, okay? It's bizarre. Imagine a group of people going up to Father Rodriguez and saying, Father Rodriguez, we would like you to join us in a search for Father Rodriguez. Uh, he would say, um, well, that's kind of silly because you don't have to search for me. I'm here. I, I already am. And they look at him and say, oh, you're a killjoy. All right, it's that ridiculous. Catholics on a search for unity. Is like John Venary looking for John Venary or John Salza looking for John Salza. Okay, we already have our unity. All right, the Protestants must come and join the Catholic Church because it's the one true Church of Christ, which I'm going to state here. Now, Pius XI and Pius XII warned Catholics to stay away from this ecumenical movement because their final unity does not consist in members of false confessions converting to Christ's one true Church for salvation. Pius XI, in his magnificent encyclical Mortalium Animus, 1968, he warns that the ecumenical movement works towards a counterfeit unity quite alien to the one church of Christ. So, modern ecumenism adopted by modern church actually follows the Protestant model, a kind of world council of churches model. So anyway, 
scholars writing in the American Ecclesiastical Review, especially Father Francis Connell, Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton, they took great pains reiterating the truth that there is only one true church outside of which there's no salvation. And they stressed this because there was an increasing number of clergymen and theologians who were coming to believe that it wasn't really necessary to be part of the church for salvation, which would tamp down, kind of destroy the whole missionary enterprise of the church. <coughs> so, in a 1944 article, the eminent father Francis Connell, he reminded Catholics they have a duty to inform the non-Catholic that he's in great danger of losing his soul if he remains in his false religion. Now listen to this. We're talking about precision of language. This is precise and also very charitable, the way it's put. We could give a whole conference on this, this little section here. McConnell, uh, um, uh, McConnell said, far from minimizing the exclusiveness of the Catholic religion, our people should be instructed unhesitatingly wherever the occasion occurs and to let the non-Catholic know that we consider them deprived of the ordinary means of salvation, however excellent their intentions. Okay, it's beautifully put. I can't, I don't have time to talk more about it. Because this brings us to Monsignor Fenton's magnificent treatment of the meaning of the word church. Now, Fenton, those of you who read Catholic Family News, I think you know who he is because I write about him quite a bit. He was really one of the, you know, one of the great theologians fighting in the last ditch before, before the council. He had been trained at the Angelicum in Rome. He wrote his doctoral dissertation under the revered Thomistic theologian, Father Garrigou Lagrange. And um, from 1944, 1963, 20 years, he was editor of the theological journal, the American Ecclesiastical Review, which doesn't exist anymore. <coughs> so he wrote a superb article in 1954 called The Meaning of the Word Church. And here Fenton explains <coughs> that the Catholic Church is not only necessary for, salva for salvation, but it's the only religious institution that can actually be called a church. Because according to divine revelation, the word church has a very definite meaning. It is the kingdom of God on earth, the chosen people of God, the people of the covenant, the one social unit outside of which there is no salvation. Magnificent article. I'm just going to quote some pieces of it. He, what, because this is what is our Lord established in the Catholic Church. Fenton explains that in the Old Testament, the word church, Latin ecclesia, I think everybody knows that, right? When you hear me use the word ecclesia, it means church, ecclesiastical, ecclesia, church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but in the Old Testament, <coughs> it's that hundred day cough I was talking to you about. Can I have some water, please? Um, in the Old Testament, the word church, the ecclesia, was the gathering of the children of Israel considered precisely as constituting God's kingdom on earth. And in the New Testament, it is used exactly in the same way. <clears throat> so, Fenton teaches. I'll have, a, I'll have a little drink of this and then we'll, then we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thus, Fenton teaches the basic truth about the society of our Lord's disciple as set forth in divine revelation, is precisely the fact that it is the divinely constituted as the ecclesia, the kingdom of God on earth, the chosen people of God. Our Lord did not bring this ecclesia into being as merely a magnificent, useful aid to salvation, but the company outside of which salvation is not to be found. And Fenton goes on to lament the misuse of the word church. He says... There could, <clears throat> there could objectively be no more misleading abuse of the term than that by which it is twisted into a mere common designation applicable to any religious society when it is applied to religious to societies <clears throat> distinct from and opposed to the organization of which it is the proper designation. So as I was saying, you're using the term Presbyterian Church or Methodist Church. You'll see... When I write about it, I usually term 
you know, I usually use a denomination or congregation or something like that. Don't use the word church. Because when you do this, Fenton points out, it is voided of all the treasures of revealed truth it is meant to convey for whom our Lord died. What our Lord promised to build, remember, I, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. The apostles knew what he was talking about here, the ecclesia. What our Lord promised to build and what he actually did build on St. Peter was definitely not merely another religious organization. It was the kingdom of God, the chosen people, the people of the covenant, the true Israel of God. That is precisely what his disciples understood him to mean when he spoke of this social unit. And he was going to establish as the ecclesia, as the ecclesia. And in a special sense, it was going to be his church his kingdom of God, his true Israel. Now, what about the Old Testament? Well, Monsignor Fenton explains that the older social unit, that is the Jewish religion of the Old Covenant, it had been the ecclesia of God, but quoting Fenton now, it lost its status as the ecclesia or the kingdom of God on earth because of its formal rejection of the Messiah. The entire old dispensation was leading us to and is all about the coming of the Messiah. Our Lord Jesus Christ superseded the Old Covenant with his New Covenant by his passion and death on the cross and the establishment of the church. And this new organization, as the faithful remnant of Israel, went on to be the ecclesia in a much more complete and perfect sense than the other had been. Now, to demonstrate this, does anyone have a Tridentine daily missile on them? Anyone? Look up the feast of August 1st, the feast of August 1st, and tell me what you see. Feast of August 1st. Comes right after July 31st. <laughs> the feast of the Holy Maccabees. The feast of the Holy Maccabees. Now, wait a minute. Maccabees is Old Testament. What are they doing in our missal? Why are they there? Because it is one social unit. It is one family tree. The Maccabees belong to us. The Maccabees are part of the ecclesia of the Old Dispensation, superseded and perfected by the ecclesia of the New Testament, the ecclesia of Christ. As I said, this is our family tree. So that's why we say the Maccabees belong to us. We have that feast in our calendar. King David belongs to us. Moses belongs to us. Abraham belongs to us. Or I should say, we are the true children of Abraham because we have adhered to the faith of Abraham regarding the Messiah. And Fenton says, he point, he's, he's pointing to this, he said, unless our people are brought to realize the import of the name church as the proper designation of our own brotherhood of Christ, then they will never be able to understand why it is that our liturgy celebrates as our feast days the anniversaries of the martyrdoms of the great heroes of the ecclesia of the old dispensation. It is because of the nature of the church or the ecclesia, ecclesia as a social unit which has been in existence since the days of Adam and Eve as the congregation faithful to Christ. Yes, Adam and Eve were part of Christ's congregation. That we hail the Maccabees and the other heroes of the Old Testament as our brethren. So, we're closing. Repeating the, name, repeating the meaning of the word church, according to divine revelation, the word church has a very strict and definite meaning. It is... I'll say it again, the kingdom of God on earth, the chosen people of God, the people of the covenant, the one social unit outside of which there is no salvation. No matter what you hear to the contrary today, because there's a lot of confusion on this point right now, and Monsignor Fenton and Father Anthony Lee and Father Edward Hanahoe and Father Connell, they saw this confusion coming. What we're saying here is what the Catholic Church teaches throughout the centuries. And four years later, in his book, The Catholic Church and Salvation, Monsignor Fenton is still insisting on the necessity of 
<coughs> excuse me, of membership in this social unit for salvation. And he points to the fact that the denial of this truth is really the central error of our time. He says, in every age of the church, there has been one portion of Catholic truth which men has been, have been especially tempted to misconstrue or to deny. In our time, it is the part of Catholic truth which was brought out with a special force and clarity by St. Peter in his first missionary sermon in Jerusalem. Remember, Peter talking to 3,000 Jews who were practicing their Jewish religion said, save yourself from this perverse generation. In order to be saved, you must be baptized. You had to make the transfer from the old dispensation, the religion of the old dispensation, to the new for salvation. And so that's why he says, brought out with a special force and clarity by St. Peter in his first missionary sermon. It is somewhat unfashionable today, 1958, it is somewhat unfashionable today to insist, as St. Peter did, that those who are outside the true church of Christ stand in need of being saved by leaving their own positions and entering the ecclesia. <coughs> Never <coughs> excuse me. Nevertheless, he says, this remains a part of God's own revealed message. So, to close, we were given the warning of the suicide of the altering the faith, of the dangers to the faith, to the life of the Christian, and to the life of the world, which was contained in, in the fat of the message, particularly the third secret. And we saw Father Gruner encountering these dangers to the faith, these suicidal attempts against the faith by all the struggles that he encountered in the seminary, but he remains an example to us because he persevered. I'm trying to remember, I heard a priest recently said, say, what is, what, is the dif, what, is the dif, what is the definition of masculinity? It is the putting aside of one's own comfort in order to pursue that which is difficult. The putting aside of one's own comfort in order to pursue that which is difficult. Father Gruner not only showed him to be a faithful Catholic, but also showed true masculinity in his pursuit of in, in, in seminary studies, and making sure that he received the formation from good professors. So we covered also two points of precision, the meaning of the word faith, the meaning of the word church, and I hope this helps us in our struggle to resist those dangers to, to the faith that are affecting the life of the church and the whole world. Thank you for your attention.